In this module, you will learn about the theoretical framework behind the ELD approach, the difference between a usual and an economic total value cost benefit analysis, and the stepwise 6 plus 1 approach. This module is directly linked with the module on communication, outreach and policy impact, since stakeholder implication in the process is crucial. Further information on the ELD approach is provided in the script. Links are provided at the end of this presentation. ELD studies comprise the following criteria. They usually apply a cost-benefit analysis. They define a period of time for the analysis. They look at clearly determined geographic areas, a degradation hotspot. They define a restoration or improvement objective. They involve all stakeholders. They analyze a set of activities or investments leading to the achievement of the objective, maybe comparing different options to identify the best set of interventions. These criteria constitute a project approach where we look at cost-benefit analysis in terms of efficiencies. ELD studies compare at least two different scenarios. One, the business as usual. The second is a set of investments for sustainable land management. In a non-sustainable production system, the business as usual scenario will show a downward trend. Sustainable land management investments will first lead to a decrease in net returns because of upfront direct costs or necessary changes in cropping patterns leading to a loss of production area. At a certain time, however, the net returns from the investments will begin to exceed the returns of a business as usual scenario. This figure shows that after a certain amount of time, the returns for, of the investment begin to exceed the returns of the business as usual scenario, which is represented at point T on the graph. Uh, another way of looking at uh, the information presented in, in the previous figure is to lay out the table, which looks into the additional revenues gained from an investment. So we see that the additional revenues might be small or even negative at the beginning. Uh, you will have additional operation, operational and investment costs. And so the net rev revenue may indeed be negative for the first few years. And the analysis of the financial flow show whether constraints exist. In other words, what is the negative cash flow at the start? These photos illustrate three cost-intensive investments that small-scale farmers are unlikely to be able to finance, such as the production of terraces, the establishment of water spreading weirs, and other gully erosion controls. The cost-benefit analysis attempts to look at the total values involved. It integrates all the benefits from ecosystem services into the cost-benefit analysis. And instead of revenues, the term benefits is used in a total cost-benefit analysis. So the table lists the total number of additional benefits and the total number of operational and investment costs to provide you with an idea of the net revenue. ELD studies can therefore inform the policy sector on the economic benefits from investments into sustainable land management. At the same time, referring to the financial analysis, they can show the need for supporting farmers to overcome financial constraints in the first years. Now we will go through the ELD 6 plus 1 approach, starting with inception, followed by geographical characteristics, listing the types of ecosystem services, identifying the role of ecosystem services and the economic valuation, identifying patterns and pressures, and finally a cost-benefit analysis leading to decision-making, and the last step is the take-action step. Step one, the inception. 
This involves the identification of the scope, location, spatial scale, and strategic focus of the study. The step is based on stakeholder consultations, whereby the objective of the study is determined together. It requires sufficient background materials on the context of the study area. Three important aspects of the inception include the involvement of policymakers in order to ensure their buy-in and interest for the study. Secondly, ELD studies can be undertaken at different scales, so it is crucial to determine the appropriate scale. And in order to develop sound scenarios, the drivers of degradation and suitable investment or transformation op options need to be identified. Step two is the geographical characteristics, the identification and analysis of the agroecological zones. This means the establishment of the geographic and ecological boundaries of the study area, assessing the quantity, spatial distribution and ecological characteristics of the land cover types, with key variables being land cover, altitude, topography, climate, precipitation, soils and vegetation. The identification of the land cover categories are then grouped into agroecological zones. As part of the characterization of the geography, the use of a geographical information system or GIS can facilitate this step. If the study is at a large scale, remote sensing data will be the basic data source. On a more local level, information collected at the ground level will play a larger role. Step three is the characterization of the types of ecosystem services. Where possible, the agroecological data should be complemented by human geographical data. Suitable time series will allow for the analysis of land use changes over time. These changes will feed into step five. Different modeling tools allow to project future trends or to assess the effects on ecological functions, but the use of these tools is not a prerequisite, at least not for the ELD studies at a local level. Step three continues with the identification and analysis of stocks and flows of ecosystem services. For each land cover category that we have identified, the ecosystem services are identified. And for this, we refer you again to the figure of the listing of uh, ecosystem services from the land. And they are classified along four categories, provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services. The definition of these four categories of ecosystem services are shown in the table attached to this slide. In theory, all ecosystem services should be valued, but for practical reasons such as limited data availability and or possibilities to collect one's own data, only the most obvious and prominent ones might be selected. Please note that different tools exist to help assess and quantify ecosystem services. Biophysical assessments, expert opinions, and or data collections are the means to collect, verify, or cross-check data. You can find more information on this step in the module on ecosystem services. Step four is the role of ecosystem services and their evaluation. This step identifies the role of ecosystem services in the livelihoods of communities living in each land cover and in the overall economic development of the study zone. Each selected service, the use and non-use value, is valued. An entire range of valuation methods exist. Hereafter, only some examples are given in the table shown on the slide. All these methods are explained in detail in the module on ecosystem services valuation. The choice of the methods varies according to the objective, but also data availability and capacities to implement each method. Attention has to be paid with estimates of the willingness to pay for an intervention or willingness to accept 
a cost of the intervention, since this might lead to high expectations over future financial gains. Step five is on patterns and pressures. It involves the identification of drivers of degradation and the SLM investment scenarios. We mentioned in more detail the drivers of degradation under the module land degradation versus sustainable land management. This step actually leads to the building a business as usual scenario. Land degradation patterns, drivers and pressures are identified and future trends projected as shown in the figure. Step six involves a cost benefit analysis. This is the assessment of the costs and benefits of sustainable land management investments and decision making. More detail on this will be found in a later module. The key steps of a cost benefit analysis are the definition of the target group, the determination of the time frame and categories of costs and benefits, the determination of a social discount rate. It also involves calculating economic benefits and costs under different scenarios, comparing the net benefits or business as usual versus the take action step. It involves deriving economic indicators of viability and undertaking a sensitivity analysis. The costs and benefits of an action or intervention are compared to that of a business as usual scenario. And we can use the table that we showed earlier, which lists the additional benefits and the additional operational and investment costs resulting in a balance or the additional net revenue. Using the spreadsheet shown in the previous slide, we can assess whether the proposed land management changes lead to net benefits, when over time the net present value of the intervention with SLM exceeds the net present value of the business as usual scenario, as shown in the figure at point T. Using the results of the cost-benefit analyses, we can undertake dialogues at the science policy interface that will lead to the definition of the actual implementation steps to prevent or reduce land degradation or to restore land. Actions usually need to be taken by landowners or users, that is changing their land use practices, by policy makers, by adapting the legal, political and economic context to enable or facilitate the adoption of sustainable land management. Also, the private sector may be involved. You will learn about stakeholder engagement and policy impact in the respective module. Further information on the six steps can be found in the ELD user guide, which is available on the website. If you have questions or you need further information, please refer to the two links that are shown on this following slide.